Stephanie has countless money-saving tactics. By using just one light bulb that she moves from room to room, she saves more than $60 a month on her electric bill. I'm not allowed to take long showers because Stephanie wants to save water for the water bill. I don't really get to watch my full body. Turn it off! To keep her water bill down, Stephanie found a way to make sure Patrick sticks to a two-minute shower. Right now, Patrick! We do not have to be cheap. We really don't. She has money, I have money. That was awful. Look, this woman is so cheap that she reuses boiling water. How much water is that? Five cents? You don't have five cents? You probably wasted five cents of time pouring that stuff into a different container so you could wash the pot. Then, she goes and feeds food out of that gross water to her kids. Worse, if her boyfriend doesn't follow her stringent rules, she yells at him. What kind of man would put up with this nonsense and then have two kids with her? Listen to this. She openly admits that she only cares about herself. My family feels that my cheapskate ways are out of there, but I don't really care. Such a wonderful partner this woman Stephanie is. Isn't she terrible? Except for one thing. This whole show is fake. Entirely fake. Stephanie and Patrick are actors, and there is no way anyone is that bad. No one is going around their house carrying around a single light bulb so they can save a few bucks on electricity. If you are financially intelligent, you'll know about a thing called opportunity cost. When you spend all of this extra work just to save a few cents, you are losing tons of money by not spending that time investing in yourself or working an actual job. If it takes you an hour to go to the store because you are busy saving money by picking all the grapes off the vine and unpeeling bananas, then I, who only spends 10 minutes at the store, am going to have vastly more time than you to produce wealth. Opportunity costs are a major thing that keeps people poor. But that's not how I know this show is fake. Sure, this stuff is ridiculous, but a lot of people do completely ridiculous things. The primary way you can tell this show is fake is because of the acting. I've taken a few acting classes in my day, and one thing I can tell you is that mimicking real emotions is actually pretty difficult. Humans are very good at determining authenticity because our survival depends on it. So actors who can play characters believably are typically people who are on screen making a good living. There aren't endless amounts of good actors for reality TV shows to just thumb through. Watch this next clip of Patrick. He invited his friends over for a football party and is explaining the rules of the house. Come on! Hey. This is, this is the second time you did that! I gotta save money for electricity! I'm sorry! I have to! I have to turn it off when it's a commercial! No, what they have this. So the only reason I would ever believe that these people came to this party was so they could be on TV. How do you know when the commercials are over when the TV is off? People aren't going to go to a party where they miss half the game because of that. You can also see that Patrick is so out of character that he is almost laughing while he says it. There are several times where both him and Stephanie do that. Once you see that, you'll start noticing all the ridiculous stuff in this segment. Like the people at the party have to carry a candle to go to the bathroom because there's only one light on in the house. Isn't that candle more expensive than a light? But Stephanie is supposedly so cheap that she won't even buy cotton swabs. You think that she wants to spend money on matches or lighters to light that candle every time someone uses it? Also, if it's nighttime and you only have one light bulb, how do you see the light fixture well enough to screw in the light bulb? I guess they use the candle for that? Wouldn't it be vastly easier and less time consuming to have the lights already installed and then just turn one off as you turn another on? Anyway, since I cover a lot of reality TV, this has been a highly requested video, especially because I recently dropped a video that I was almost done with because I found out that a crucial part of the story was lied about. We'll get into it, but first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent, and it helps fund a lot of the quality improvements that I make on this channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my BitChute channel, my Minds page, and my Parlor page can be found in the description as well. Now before I talk about the show I dropped and a different huge case of misrepresentation from an extremely popular show, I would like to expand on this idea of proper affect. Affect is your emotional state. The difference between a good actor and a bad actor is that good actors can accurately mimic real affect. Bad actors can't. 
you can see tons of examples of bad acting on daytime TV. Here's an example from the Steve Wilco show. Here's uh, your girl, Kimberly. Not that long. <laughs> make you crazy. Look at all the messages, Tyree. What messages? What messages between you and your co-worker? Oh. Whatever, whatever, I do what I want. That's not how real people act. She is way too emotional for someone who just stepped out onto a stage in front of a bunch of people she doesn't know. You expect me to believe that both of them are completely comfortable hashing out personal drama in front of a live audience? Neither of them are even nervous. There is no withholding of emotions or fear of public speaking like there would be with real people. I will note that Steve Wilkos was one of the security people on Jerry Springer, which is another fake show. Does this mean that every daytime talk show is fake? No, but if you can't tell that these people are actors, then that's a problem. Because if you can't determine which emotions are real and which emotions are not real, you're going to have a very hard time telling if people in your life are lying to you. Just to drive my point home on proper emotion, allow me to show you some examples from past material that I've used. Speaking of TLC, and not every show on TLC is fake or entirely fake, one of the shows I covered is called My 600 Pound Life. I think this show is a perfect example because we can see the contrast of someone who is experiencing real emotions versus when that same person is trying to fake those emotions to appear interesting. This episode of My 600 Pound Life follows Maya and Christian as they work together to help Maya lose weight. Here is a pivotal scene that occurs after Maya has failed to meet her weight loss goals. I hate you for doing this to me, Christian. Why can't you just answer the questions? Oh, you're costing me my weight loss surgery and you're ruining everything! Mom, <laughs> Christian everything up at the doctor's office. You see all of that excellent emotion? That was real. It's very difficult to fake that believably. And I know it's not fake because there are other parts of the show where Maya is trying to fake emotions like anger and she can't. I can't believe this. They don't have the right car reserved for us. This is completely ridiculous. I literally cannot believe how much wrong information has been given to me about today and how so many people can screw up. Allow me to break some of the magic of TV. All of these voiceovers are recorded after the show is already done. They don't do them while the show is going on because they don't know what scenes they're going to pick and doing voiceovers for everything would be vastly more work. So we hear Maya describing what's going on after she is out of the emotional state she was in when she was experiencing that stuff and she can't show proper emotion. Her voice is flat and not in the proper tone of someone who is actually angry. This means that Maya was being authentic when she was yelling and crying at her ex-boyfriend. If she was an actress, she would be able to show proper emotion in the doctor's office and while she was doing the voiceover. In fact, it would be better for ratings if she could. But she can't, and they don't hire actors who are that good, because actors who are that good are busy making real money instead of doing reality TV. You can also see a lot of this go on in 90 Day Fiancé. Here's an example of real emotion from that show. <laughs> And Fisa got mad at me because I left her and I tried to go see the lawyer alone. What is the problem? I am coming back. I am coming back. Try that yourself. Can you replicate that demon scream that Anfisa just gave? I certainly can't. There are all kinds of techniques that you have to use to put yourself in that emotional state. That takes tons of practice. One thing that stands out about 90 Day Fiancé is that if something interesting happens off camera, they will reshoot that scene, which, by the way, I don't consider fakery because those things actually happened. That's more so Hollywood magic. But if you pay attention, you can actually tell which scenes were reshot and which scenes were not. In the reshot scenes, their voices are flat just like Maya's was when she did the voiceover for My 600 Pound Life. That's because they aren't experiencing the emotions that they are trying to fake. It's more like they are trying to focus on bullet points to accurately recreate the conversation they had off camera. 
Now, does that mean that everything on 90 Day Fiancé is fake? No. The people on 90 Day Fiancé are real people who have real social media accounts and make a stink about the show not paying them because American law prevents the ones on visas from being paid. And I assure you, the ones who do get paid, get paid almost nothing for the show. But on that point of fakery, even ridiculous things like this are real. The ideal girl isn't thinking that her ideal guy still lives at home in mom's basement, right? Mom! But I do. Not sure if you want to go on a date with me? Well, would a t-shirt change your mind? I made out with Skippy for three minutes, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Skippy likes to make t-shirts. I do. Did you make I do. One? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I am, in fact, fun and single and ready to mingle. <laughs> I want a girl to be like, wait, you're sing how are you still single? Yes, this guy Skippy is a real person who has been making YouTube videos on basically the same idea for years. He still hasn't found his soulmate. So here's the big question. Why would they fake this stuff? Why would they use convenient editing or frame things in a certain way? Well, the reason they do that is to make the show sellable. Every single piece of media needs what is called a hook. Comedy has to have a hook. News has a hook. Music has a hook. Books have hooks. Movies have hooks. A hook is something that catches your attention. If there is no hook, you won't consume the media because it will be boring. In fact, in terms of YouTube, a lot of really talented creators fail to build a following because they are simply not hooking their audience. When it comes to reality TV, a lot of times they have real people, but they don't have a hook, so they implant one. This brings us to the show I had to drop, which was Kitchen Nightmares. While the episode I was going to cover did contain real people, it contained a real failing restaurant with awful management and an awful chef, however, the hook that show used was implanted. This was a problem because my entire video was based on their hook. The show's producers know that Ramsey fixing a broken restaurant is not good enough. It needs something extra added to catch lots of people's attention. This is actually one of the major differences between the British version of Kitchen Nightmares and the American version of Kitchen Nightmares. The British version is way more relaxed and just gets to the point, whereas the American version is more edgy and creates a sort of story around the restaurant. I'm not saying that every episode of Kitchen Nightmares is like this, but in this episode, you can definitely tell the narrative is forced, and that almost made me initially refuse to cover it. It's too bad I didn't stick with that judgment. But instead of me telling you about it, let me just roll the intro clip I planned for that video. Tonight on Kitchen Nightmares... A husband and wife team have lost their passion, not just for the restaurant, but for each other as well. The husband is drowning at work. Whoa, come on. While the wife prefers to avoid it. Biggest problem in the restaurant right now would definitely have to be Lisa. Mark's in the restaurant at least 10 or 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of the time, Lisa is on the beach, down the Cape somewhere. Mark and I's relationship has been better. Let's just say there's an indent on the couch from where he sleeps. So the narrative for that episode was, lazy wife has her husband work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, while she takes vacations on the beach. When she comes into the restaurant, she doesn't work, she just texts on her phone and leaves after two hours. She believes that she's doing a lot. She comes in in the morning, couple days a week, that's really it. She's in two days a week, you're in uh, seven. I see myself struggling and I don't know why she's not jumping in to help. I have to work twice as hard because she doesn't. If their restaurant fails, so will their marriage. Okay, that premise right there is ridiculous and kind of like it was written for a movie. Their marriage isn't reliant on Ramsey's three-day makeover to keep their restaurant in business. A segment of my script was dedicated to pointing out that the part about their marriage was probably just so they had an interesting story to tell for TV. Even if that story wasn't completely true, it still doesn't hurt the video I was going to make. So what if they made some parts up? They still had a failing restaurant, the husband and the wife were still severely unqualified to do their jobs, they still had a psychic in the restaurant for some reason. Holy crap. Jessica? Yes? Is that a crystal ball on the table? Yeah, she's a psychic reader. She gets paid through the restaurant. Oh, wow. Hello, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Yeah, well, thank you. I've never seen a hurt psychic oh. before. What was the first fortune you predicted? Um, my girlfriend was trying to get pregnant, and, okay. um, and I told her I saw a girl, and she got pregnant with a girl. I mean, the girl boy 50-50, so it's not that impressive. I don't believe they made this part up. 
I have seen plenty of businesses do dumb stuff like this. So the false divorce narrative doesn't ruin the show for me because it has nothing to do with why their business was failing. The reason their business was failing was because Lisa wasn't pulling her weight. Except there is one major problem with that narrative. In order to make sure my videos are completely honest, I fact checked them multiple times. This was actually a major reason why the video I did on the island with Bear Grylls took over two weeks to make. I kept having to fact check everything back against 13 episodes of source material to make sure that I got it all right. Even if you have already seen a piece of information, a lot of times two days later when you go to talk about it, you remember it incorrectly, so it's best to recheck things. When I was at the last part of editing the Kitchen Nightmares video, I was doing some final fact checking to make sure everything was good to go, and that's when I found out that the hook of the episode was made up. It was what is called a lie by omission. A lie by omission is when a piece of information is intentionally left out of a story in order to mislead you. The media does this all the time. One famous lie by omission was the Covington Kids case. The story was that 16-year-old Nick Sandman throws entitled smirks at a Native American who was just trying to show him some traditional music. This narrative led to tons of threats being thrown at a child. The only problem is that when you zoom out for a second, you find out that the Native American just all of a sudden got into this kid's face, and the look Nick Sandman is displaying is because he is uncomfortable. The zoomed-in story where they just show you the smirk doesn't tell you that. The reality is that this situation had over an hour of footage showing a lot of things happening on that day that the media intentionally didn't cover. In the Kitchen Nightmares episode, the lie by omission was that the reason Lisa wasn't helping her husband Mark at the restaurant was not because she was lazy, but because she was at home taking care of a child. She wasn't at the restaurant because she was a stay-at-home mom. After I found that out, I still gave the show the benefit of the doubt, partly because I didn't want to throw away 50 hours or so of work. So I said, okay, her kid looks pretty old. He probably goes to school. Why isn't she helping out at the restaurant in the morning? The show said that Lisa shows up at the restaurant two or three days a week for only about two or three hours in the morning. Certainly, she can do more than that. What time does the restaurant open? 8 a.m.? 9 a.m.? I did some more research and found out that the place opens up at 11.30 a.m. on weekdays, and two of those days out of the week, it opens up at 3.30 p.m., so for three of the weekdays, the restaurant would have been open for about two or three hours while her son was still in school. And of course, on the weekends, she would be at home watching him. This would be entirely appropriate and would be considered her pulling her own weight in the relationship. Now, this was filmed in 2012, so the show's producers may have been expecting Lisa to take on a more modern role instead of taking care of her kid. But seeing that their marriage narrative was probably also a lie, I'm assuming they intentionally omitted the fact that she had a kid to make the show more spicy. It's been nine years, and from all the information I was able to find, Mark and Lisa still appear to be in a happy marriage, which actually makes this next clip make sense. I originally thought it was out of place. Lisa, the balance isn't equal. I want to, I want to turn around. You sure? Positive. Let's just really work together on this and let's make it happen we can do it i'm excited to turn around people don't just flip like that they don't go from being on vacation all the time and working four to six hours a week to working 10 hours a day seven days a week that was a major criticism of mine but if you factor in that she wasn't actually lazy then this makes sense to be honest though i don't philosophically agree ramsey may have been right their restaurant was in such deep water that both of them would have to forgo their child and work insane hours for it to be a success. They probably didn't do that. I read that they changed everything back to the way it was before the show, so the restaurant ended up failing in 2016. I do want to stress, though, that the lie by omission doesn't mean the whole show is fake. It doesn't mean that Gordon Ramsay's advice is wrong, either. On the contrary... I have used a lot of the principles that Ramsey preaches on that show for this YouTube channel, and I have to say, they work. What it does mean, though, is that you have to look at the things that you see on TV critically and make your best judgment. Don't just blindly believe everything you see. Now, there's one more big example of misinformation from reality TV that I want to cover, 
But before I do that, I want to add in a quick honorable mention. This happens constantly, and it very frequently causes me to cover material differently. Oftentimes, editors will mix in clips together to make it seem like someone was saying something that they didn't actually say, particularly when that person's off camera and people can't see their face. Here's an example from that same episode of Kitchen Nightmares. The scary part is, I thought all our food was good. Oh my god, what am I going to do? So I know that they do this, and even I had to listen to this clip multiple times to hear that it was pieced together. The part where Mark said, I thought the food was good, is edited. Listen to it again. The scary part is, I thought all our food was good. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Now, they could have made this edit to shorten what he was saying, and that edit doesn't change the context of what was being said. I certainly do that all the time, which is why I link all the source material in the description of every video so that everyone can see that I'm not taking people out of context. But in the case of Kitchen Nightmares, we can't see the source material for the show, so we have to keep a critical eye and note that Mark may have not actually said that. Okay, now for the final act. This is something I've wanted to talk about for almost a year. The reason I didn't talk about it before was because the truth destroyed the hook I was going to use for it. If there is no hook, no one will watch the video. If no one watches the video, it's almost like nothing was said at all. Usually in situations where I don't have a good hook that will sell a video, I talk about it in the community tab. It takes somewhere around 40 to 60 hours to make most videos, but only about 30 minutes to an hour to write out a community post. And I did just that last year when the show Tiger King originally aired. I was going to make a video about Carol Baskin and her ex-husband's disappearance, but after three or four days of work, I decided to drop the video because Tiger King's narrative wasn't true. I'm glad I finally have a reason to talk about it, because it turns out that Tiger King lied about Carol Baskin, and she has all the receipts. Certainly media will do little things to deceive you, but in this case, the producers of Tiger King just flat out lied. Shortly after the show aired, Carol got a ton of backlash, so she released this very lengthy article and a playlist discussing every lie Tiger King told about her and her business. There are a lot of them, so I'm only going to go over the major ones that people care about. If you want to see everything, the playlist and the article are both listed in the description. Let's start with the low-hanging fruit first, and then we will get to the story about Carol's husband, mostly because it makes sense to start with a narrative that Tiger King was trying to set. Something you do when you write a script is set a premise. A premise is a one-sentence description of the idea that you are trying to convey throughout your story. This helps keep you on track and remove ideas that are irrelevant to the plot. If I were to write a premise for Tiger King based on what I saw on the show, it would be, everyone who owns tigers in a zoo or a sanctuary is a horrible, horrible person. Joe Exotic is horrible, Doc Antle is horrible, so certainly Carol Baskin must be horrible too. That's how the show tried to paint her, and they had to throw down some serious lies to make their narrative work. The first lie they had to tell was that an animal sanctuary is essentially the same as a zoo, merely because both of them have animals on display. This is a big problem with media. They love to remove all context and nuance. Yes, Carol's sanctuary has animals in cages, just like Joe Zoo. However, the difference is that sanctuaries don't buy, breed, sell, allow public contact, or take the animals off-site for public exhibition. Zoos are there to make money by putting animals on display, while sanctuaries rescue the animals from terrible situations and either reintroduce them into the wild or, if they can't do that, they provide the animals a place to live out the rest of their lives. In terms of tigers, the big moneymaker is tiger cubs. People want their pictures taken with the cubs, and they want to pet the cubs. Third Next time, level. Second this week. You can't put a price on holding a baby tiger. That's his favorite animal. I mean, I hit the lottery, I'll pay these people whatever they want for me to go down to the reservation every day and play with them. <laughs> After about 12 weeks, the cubs become too big and too dangerous to allow customers to be around them. That's the point where they can start removing people's limbs. So once the tigers hit 12 weeks, they are essentially a liability that makes zoos little money, and then you have to feed them for like 15 years. The tiger breeders will also lie and say that the reason they are breeding tigers is to preserve an endangered species, when it's really more about the $100,000 or so they can profit off of each cub in the 12 weeks that they are useful. If people are concerned about tigers, they should be donating their money to places like mine, where we breed them. Number one, they're an endangered species. Duh, what's the first thing you should do to protect an endangered species? Make more. 
In terms of conservation, we already have DNA saved so that future technology can repopulate them. So yes, tigers are an endangered species, but the problem is that tigers born in captivity cannot be released back into the wild. Here's Carol saying that. I think it's important to point out that I don't believe cats belong in cages. And that's why I'm being called a hypocrite, because I keep saying cats don't belong in cages. And then they're like, well, why do you have them in cages? I have them in cages because they can't go free. One, it's illegal. You can't take a captive-born exotic cat and turn it loose in the wild anywhere. And while it may work for small cats like bobcats or lynx, it does not work for lions or tigers, despite the stupid programming that you may have seen on television that made it look like that's a thing. It's not a thing. Ask anybody who's involved in conservation, and they will say there is no program that has ever successfully released a captive-born lion or tiger back to the wild. The reason why tigers born in captivity can't be released into the wild is one, no one wants a tiger in their backyard, and two, they haven't figured out how to reintegrate them. Certain cats can be released back into the wild, and Carol's Sanctuary Big Cat Rescue does do that. But as for the tigers, they have to remain in captivity. Another major difference between Carol's Sanctuary and a zoo is that if you dump a cat off at the sanctuary, she makes you sign a contract that says she can sue you if you ever purchase a big cat or breed one again. Otherwise, tons of tiger breeders would just keep dumping their cats off at the sanctuary as soon as they hit 12 weeks. But of course, Tiger King doesn't tell you that the sanctuary has to keep the cats because they can't be released into the wild. They also don't show you that the cages at Big Cat Rescue are massive. Instead, they show you the smallest part of the cage, which is the feeding lot. Here are some of the pictures that they show you. You just see the smallest part of the cage and you never see the full size. They even have Joe Exotic yell about how small the cages are. Why would you give to a facility to rescue animals to live in luxurious cages? Well, how about that one? That mountain lion sticking his head through a hole in the fence in order to drink out of a- Joe started bashing her, she started bashing him. The crazy thing is, is that they had footage of Joe flying over Carol's property in a helicopter. So Joe knew how big her cages were. And certainly the producers knew how big the cages were because they spent a ton of time on the property filming Carol. My understanding is that the cages at Big Cat Rescue are far larger than Joe's cages. Here's how big Carol's cages actually are. In fact, we had a bobcat that was in rehab, and I had her on a camera, and I was able, from the size of the cage, the rehab cages are 4,600 square feet. And so I was able to tell from the path that she took, in a single night, she traveled over 16 miles. See, they are huge. But that doesn't follow the narrative or the premise. The premise is that all Tiger Zoo and sanctuary owners are trash, so they had to make Carol look like an insane person. This is how they introduce her. Here comes Carol. Oh, she's dressed perfectly. More like this. Then they go to this clip of her where her husband says this. I think it would be fair to say that Carol is the Mother Teresa of cats. So the first thing you see of Carol is them framing her as an insane hypocrite who is full of herself, which means you already don't like her, and if you don't like someone, it's easier to feed you lies about them, because people won't go through the work to fact-check and defend the people they don't like. That's one of the major differences between my channel and most people in media. Every person I talk about gets the chance to make their case and defend their point of view. They all get a chance to convince me that I'm wrong. Originally, I was on the team that was against Carol Baskin until I saw her rebuttal. But of course, in terms of the media, we can't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Instead, the producers of Tiger King do this. They want people to believe that Carol has a zoo just like Joe Exotic does. Carol, PETA, those characters want to attack everyone. Carol wants to be the last man standing. There can be only one, and it has to be her. In my opinion, Carol Baskin was as bad as Joe. They were both, you know, taking advantage of exotic animals to make money. One of the ways they made Carol's sanctuary look like a zoo was they took a once-a-year event that Big Cat Rescue has and made it seem like that event was every day at the sanctuary. Here is Carol talking about that on her YouTube channel. Some people take issue with the fact that we have guided tours. What Tiger King did was they showed a one-day-a-year event that we have where people are allowed to wander through the sanctuary. 
The rest of the time, all of our tours are guided. You can even see her on Tiger King implying that this was a special event when she says this. Because we're going to have so many people here today, we have brought in 76 of our own volunteers. This is kind of implying that the amount of people there on that day is something unusual for Big Cat Rescue. They had so many volunteers that day because in order to let people roam free like that, there has to be a bunch of people making sure visitors don't stick their hands in the cages. Outside of that, Big Cat Rescue does guided tours that are very small. Most importantly, at the end of each tour, they ask everyone to talk to Congress about signing a bill that would put her sanctuary out of business. If Carol was trying to perpetuate the problem and was the same as a tiger zoo, she wouldn't do that. I'm not entirely sure why Carol does the tours, but I imagine it's not free to keep a ton of cats on your property, so the money has to come from somewhere. And as I suggested before, it's probably a way of promoting awareness to stop cub petting. But the horrible framing doesn't stop there. Remember, they want to paint Carol as the exact same thing as Joe Exotic. So they took footage from like 20 years ago of her breeding cats. This is the uh, VHS that she made back in the day. The last time I've probably seen it was 1996. Our names are Don and Carol Lewis. We have really enjoyed our exotics. Throughout this tape, we'll show you how we take them from the mother acclimate them to social life with people. They have to be taken this young from the mother in order to make good quality pets from them. This is one of the major things that I hate about cancel culture. If you ever once did a bad thing in your past, then you are forever evil and can't be redeemed. Literally no one can live by that standard. Not even the celebrities that promote this kind of cancel culture. I've mentioned before that I listened to an old radio show called Loveline that had a ton of celebrity guests. I have heard many of them who would now be pro-censorship repeatedly use the F-word just 15 years ago. F-word is in bundle of sticks, not the swear word. I even have an episode of Loveline where super woke Jimmy Kimmel makes fun of transgendered people. I linked it in the description for you and timestamped it. Oh wait, I forgot. Your past behaviors only count if you are on the wrong team. As for Carol, yes, it appears that she did used to breed exotic cats. However, she learned it was wrong and stopped doing it. But they still use this as, See, Carol is just as evil as everyone else. Back in the uh, early 90s, she bred and sold cats. And <laughs> it's so funny because the very people that are against breeding used to do the same thing. Are people not allowed to learn things are wrong and stop doing them? Are people not allowed to learn from their mistakes? I will say that as a person who has made bad choices in the past and learned from them, the only kind of person who would suggest that someone is evil forever for making one mistake is someone who has never learned from their mistakes and has never corrected their own bad behavior. They think, well, I can't stop doing bad things, so no one else must be able to stop either. This is sick and disgusting, and it only shows you how immoral the proponents of cancel culture are. They are screwed up people who have no intent on fixing their own problems, so they just project their awful psychology onto everyone else. Alright, last but not least, the disappearance of Don Lewis. Speaking of framing, one of the things that Tiger King didn't really get into was that Don Lewis was a really, really bad guy. Don Lewis had many women in his life, but the reason his ex-wife, the one before Carol, filed for divorce was because he had relations with her 15-year-old niece. Also, Carol says this in her Tiger King rebuttal. And then he insisted that our daughter, my daughter, live with us. And she hadn't lived with us since she was, gosh, I don't even know. Uh, well, actually, I do know. She was 12. And so when she was 12, she had her own trailer and she took care of all of her own dishes and her own food and her own laundry and everything. And she had a fenced-in yard and a dog, and she lived, you know, right next to us here at the sanctuary. But I just thought it was weird that he was insisting that she be under the same roof with us, and I held firm. I wasn't going to let him have access to her, and I said no. Carol was afraid that Don would get at her daughter, so she moved her daughter out of their house. Even if you look at how Carol and Don met, they met when she was either 19 or 20, and he was in his 40s. He picked her up on the side of the road as she looked distraught because she had just gotten into a major fight with her husband at the time. I will note that Carol is a trauma survivor, and she said that on Tiger King. 
Now let me say that if you think that Don Lewis just randomly found Carol on the street that night, then you don't know how abusers work. This guy was on the prowl looking for someone like Carol because women like Carol will accept his abusive behavior. And he did a ton of abusive things. Which begs the questions, why didn't Carol leave him after he lied to her about leaving his wife? Or after he gave her a fake name? Or after he cheated on her with tons of women? Or when she had to move her daughter into a separate place from their house to keep her away from him? Good questions. Questions that have no good answers. However, Carol openly admits to her mistakes and calls herself an idiot who was desperate for staying with Don. I met Don Lewis when I was 19 in 1981, and he was 22 or 23 years my senior. He said that his wife had thrown him out when I met him, and we got involved with each other, and when he did end up going back to her, I should have ended it. If I had been the person I am today, I absolutely would have ended it. But I was a 19-year-old kid. I was stupid, and I was desperate for somebody who loved me, and I thought he did. This is the most intelligent and mentally healthy thing I have heard Carol say. She didn't blame other people. She took responsibility for allowing an abuser into her life. These are the kinds of words people use when they have moved past their trauma. If they are still blaming other people for their mistakes, then they haven't done any real work. Now, when it comes to the accusations of murder, the evidence is pretty much nothing. By the way, since we are talking about mainstream media, if you think the mainstream media just conveniently started lying about everything in the past few years, the minute independent content creators could start fact-checking them, then think again. They have been lying the whole time. You just didn't know about it because the mainstream media controlled all the flow of information. One such lie they ran was that Carol put her husband in a meat grinder to destroy the evidence. To help perpetuate that lie, Tiger King shows a picture of a giant meat grinder when they talk about the story to make you think that was the size of the meat grinder that Carol owned. Here is the actual size of the meat grinder that they accused Carol of using to destroy evidence. Do you really think she could destroy anything with that? And oh wait, despite that Tiger King showed a massive meat grinder, they have a clip of Carol saying that her grinder was small. I guess they wanted plausible deniability in case she sued them for slander. His own kids demanded that they DNA test the meat grinder. Sheriff's office wouldn't do it. We had a meat grinder. If you've ever seen a butcher boy meat grinder, it's about that big around. I'm not going to go into the rest of the conspiracy theories because that would be pointless. It's pointless because the investigators are saying this. Is, um, is Carol Baskin a suspect right now? She isn't. She isn't. She isn't even a person of, of interest at this point. We have no evidence to deem her or anyone else uh, uh, equally as important as, as a suspect in, in this case. Even the Tiger King investigator, who seemed to be against Carol, said this. I cannot tell you that we have zeroed in on any particular suspect. I, I'd be remiss if I said that. There is absolutely no physical evidence at this point in time that would point at one particular individual. Again, if you want to hear every rebuttal Carol has, her playlist is linked in the description. Which now brings us to the question of motive. Why would Carol want to make her husband disappear? Well, she was accused of doing so because she wanted money. There's just one major problem with that, which is that Carol was already really successful in real estate before Don Lewis disappeared. Another obvious point that Carol brought up in her rebuttal was that if she wanted money from Don, all she would have to do was divorce him. When his ex-wife divorced him, he essentially gave her whatever she wanted. That ended up being around a million dollars worth of cash and property. Carol could have easily gotten the same or more. What likely happened is this. Don's ex-wife Gladys blew through her divorce settlement in about five years, so she went after him for more money. Don disappears, and it turns out that he had signed a paper that said in the event of his disappearance, Carol gets power of attorney. Here is a document that says that, and when they show it on Tiger King, you can even see that they edited over it to mislead you. This left Carol in a position where she got control over Don's money. Don's ex-wife wanted that money, therefore she went on a smear campaign to accuse Carol of murder in an attempt to get access to the money. When in reality, Don was a really bad guy. 
he probably had tons of enemies, and one of those enemies caused his disappearance. That or his ex-wife Gladys did it. She certainly had more of a motive than Carol did, though I think that's unlikely. Before I get to my last point, I do want to say that just because this stuff was a lie doesn't mean that the entirety of Tiger King was a lie. We know that Joe Exotic is a bad guy. There is plenty of evidence of him doing some really awful stuff on camera that needs no context, like the dozens of examples of him misusing firearms. Unfortunately, I can't show those on YouTube, but there are plenty of instances of that in the show, one where he almost accidentally shoots one of the cameramen. So that stuff's not false or framed improperly. However, the more stunning thing is that I can point out just how garbage the producers of Tiger King are. Remember that I said that the reason some of these reality TV shows reframe, lie, or misrepresent information is to create a hook that will catch the attention of viewers. If you know anything about storytelling, then you know that they didn't have to lie about Carol to make the story interesting. There are a few story arcs that work and sell well, one of them being drama, which is the story arc that Tiger King chose. Another is a hero story. That being said, here is how you reframe Tiger King so that it's an honest story, but it's also interesting. Every good hero story contains a lie that the hero believes. The story arc is the journey of him discovering that lie and replacing it with new information that leads him to a happier life. An example of that would be Harry Potter, who believes he can do everything by himself, but by the end of the series, he learns that there is power in numbers. Lies can also be told to the audience. In fact, if you make the audience believe a lie and then reveal that falsehood later in the story, you call that a twist. That leads to a lot of very good story arcs. So the way you start Tiger King off is to frame Joe Exotic as the altruistic hero. Tigers are an endangered species, and Joe is breeding them to help them repopulate. Dedicate two episodes to that. Then, on episode 3, you pull back the curtain and show the audience who Joe really is. Now they see the guy who was portrayed as a hero is actually a villain. This kind of hook catches people's interest because it disturbs their view of the story, and it actually reflects reality. A lot of real villains pretend to be the hero, and you can see tons of successful stories using that narrative. Off the top of my head, Walter White from Breaking Bad. He starts off as just some nice guy who is trying to pay for his cancer treatment, but as the show progresses, we see Walter is a pretty evil guy. So you paint Joe Exotic as a hero, you reveal him as the villain on episode 3, and once he is revealed as the villain, you introduce the new hero, which is Carol, someone who actually wants to help the tigers instead of exploiting them for money. There, now you have an honest story that is also interesting. But they aren't going to do things like that. Why? Because honesty is costly, time-consuming, and it takes more skill. First of all, a narrative that says everyone is evil is a lot easier to carry out than a narrative that has nuance. Real honesty is difficult. I mean, look at what I had to do, to be honest. I had to drop seven days of work, I had to lose money, I had to lose a ton of potential followers that the video on Kitchen Nightmares would have brought in, a video that, by the way, no one would have questioned me on. If I lied about that Kitchen Nightmares episode, no one would have Googled the owners of that restaurant to find out that they had a kid. I had to go out of my way and do several searches to figure that out. It would have been easy money to just lie. Even with the Tiger King stuff, I lost three days of work on that last year and everyone already believed that Carol was the villain. Continuing that narrative would have been easy and a lot of YouTubers did that without listening to her rebuttal. Not to mention, to make sure that I was being honest for this video, I had to go back and listen to Carol's playlist all over again, and I had to re-watch Tiger King. That took two days of my time when I could have just simply gone off of memory and gotten a ton of stuff wrong. Honesty is hard work. It's much easier to profit off of lies instead of spending a ton of time fact-checking everything. It's easier to go for low-rent drama than it is to invest your time into building enough skill so you don't have to lie to make a story interesting. Speaking of, you'll see the mainstream media, especially the news, lying because it's easy all the time. There is no investigative journalism anymore because it's much easier to just sit at home and make up a story that fits your narrative. If your narrative is wrong, well, then just lie to make it correct. And people will believe you because most people don't fact check stuff. 
Whether or not they believe what's being said is based on what they think of the presenter. People do that because no one has taught them how to look at information critically, which is probably by design considering authority figures didn't just start lying yesterday. If people knew how to fact check them, they wouldn't get away with it. The reason I am as honest as I can be and I go way out of my way to make it as easy as possible for you guys to fact check me is because you can only lie for so long before the entire system breaks down. These MSM people are profiting off the good faith that other people built up and in so doing they are destroying that good faith. If you want to have freedom, if you want to have a good life and own nice things, you can't do that by lying all the time. Truth is the mechanism that we use to solve problems, and if you lie constantly, you won't be able to figure out what's wrong with you. Spoilers, there's something wrong with everyone. No one is perfect. Eventually, you are going to have to do the work of confronting your own demons. So for me, when it comes to content creation, my job is to do all of the hard work and suffer the negative consequences of honesty, like losing a lot of material that I could have easily profited off of. I do this so that my viewers value truth, and I do so in the hopes that other content creators put in their due diligence to be honest. That way, the good faith that MSM destroyed can be restored. What it means for you, the viewer, and really everyone, is that you have to start putting in the work to be critical of the material that you are being presented. Don't just blindly believe stuff. Look into people's claims and see them for yourself. If you don't do this, you are ripe to be misled. If you aren't doing this, start now. Feel free to fact check me. All of my sources are in the description. But don't just look at my sources. Tell other creators you watch to cite their sources too and ask for transparency. If they don't do that, stop watching them. Change always starts with yourself and if you want all these media corporations to stop lying to you, then start fact checking them and stop being so easily misled. If you weren't so easy to fool, they wouldn't get away with it. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. You can find all of those links in the description. Last, if you haven't checked me out on BitChute, Parler, or Minds.com, you can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.